Matthew chapter 6, we are right back into the Sermon on the Mount, where church, Jesus is teaching us about what? About true righteousness. Okay, let's, let's try it again. Let's go for just, that was a three, give me a five on the enthusiasm scale, all right? It's not junior church, so I don't need nine or ten, but uh, give me a five. Jesus is teaching us about... True righteousness, very good. And so in chapter 5, he's dealt with our heart and the issues of the heart. And now he's beginning to deal with habits of our spiritual lives and how they play out. How we live life on the outside. Someone with true righteousness, the reality is, will produce true righteousness without. And as we began to look at Matthew chapter 6, Jesus began to talk first and foremost about alms, about helping those who are less fortunate than us in some area, about our heart of giving. Jesus is going to continue tonight by beginning to teach on prayer. Now to understand the context a little bit, by and large, the Jewish people and the religion of Judaism had gotten prayer all wrong. It was something that they did that was formulated, something that they did that was ritualistic, it was designed for certain people, at certain places, at certain times. And so it was more of a pretense than a practical element of their religious life. Church, how many of us recognize tonight that prayer is not a pretense? That prayer is not just something that we do when we come to church. Prayer is not just something that we do so other people will in turn know that we are good Christians. No, prayer is not a pretense. Prayer is a privilege that grants you and I access to an all-knowing, all-powerful, always-present, loving God. But, how do we view prayer? Not just corporately, not just, well, when the preacher asks the question, this is the correct religious answer. No, let's examine our lives tonight. Let's examine the habits of our heart and of our hands. How do we view prayer? How do we use prayer? Because the reality is, is that while prayer is a major avenue of spiritual power and one of our greatest spiritual resources, it's also one of the most neglected avenues for modern believers. So for the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at Jesus' instruction here. And like the disciples of old, this is our heart, this is our desire that our Lord would teach us to pray. So let's look at the power of prayer tonight. Matthew chapter 6 and begin our study in verse number 5. The Bible says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. They have their reward. Jesus here begins tonight by talking to us about cautions against performance prayer. Cautions against performance prayer. And so he begins by giving us some of those characteristics by what is performance prayers. Well, first he points out that performance prayer, it has the wrong motives. Verse number 5, he says, do not be as the hypocrites are. That the hypocrites only pray to be seen and heard of men instead of God. And the reality is, if we're more concerned about what brother so-and-so or sister such-and-such thinks when we pray, we've got the wrong motive. That the motive is not to be seen of men, but the motive is to be seen and heard of God. Not only does performance prayer have the wrong motive, but it also has the wrong methods. Not only to be seen of men, but to present oneself prominently and publicly before men. That phrase there, to be seen of men, uh, in verse number 5, uh, has the idea of to shine. In other words, when they begin to pray, it's almost like they themselves begin to glow with the Shekinah glory of God. And men look and say, wow, what, a, what an 
eloquent prayer. What a wonderful prayer. Boy, look at him. Boy, he really knows how to word those prayers to get a hold of God. And the Pharisees, that was the whole goal, was to be seen of men, was to shine. Prayer was one of those opportunities to let the whole world know that, yep, I'm way more spiritual than you are. Jesus says, no. No. And he cautions against performance prayer. Because performance prayer ends in catastrophe. We've seen the characteristics of performance prayer, but Jesus also does show us the catastrophe that performance prayer brings. He says, verily I say unto you, they have their reward. That's the same setup that he gave us when talking about alms. In other words, the verbiage is that when you pray to be seen and heard of men, and you are seen and heard of men, you have your reward. It's like receipt for paid in full. You know what the catastrophe of performance prayer is? Is that it, is, it has a shallow reception, meaning that it is only seen and heard of men. It doesn't matter how spiritual other people think you are. It doesn't matter how eloquent other people think the prayer might be. If the whole point of you praying was, boy, I hope this sounded good. I hope this went okay. Your prayer didn't get beyond the ceiling. Didn't get beyond the broadcast reach of the radio or the internet. It didn't go nowhere that really matters. Because when you do it to be seen of men, guess what? You are. Congratulations. You're paid in full. And so performance prayer only receives a shallow reception. Performance prayer only receives a shallow reward. In other words, you're only going to get rewarded once. And I'm sorry, we've got a lot of wonderful people here and a lot of wonderful people watching by way of Facebook and listening by way of radio, but can't none of you answer my prayers the way I need God to answer prayers. I mean, some of you have magnificent resources, but you don't have the resources he does. And some of you have magnificent knowledge, but you don't have the knowledge that he does. And understand, church, whether we're praying in our family circle at night before we go to bed or our family circle in the morning before we break for work and school, or whether we're praying in a group on a Wednesday night, or whether we're praying behind a pulpit, whether we've just been saved, whether we've been saved for 50 years, whether we're a deacon, a a Sunday school teacher, teacher, a preacher, a bus worker, whatever, when we pray to be seen and heard of men, it has a shallow reception and a shallow reward. That is the catastrophe of performance prayer. So Jesus says as we get into this, we need to understand this from the get-go. Prayer is not to be seen and heard of other people. Prayer is not to shine in front of others. Prayer is not for men but to God and God alone. And so he begins by cautioning us against performance prayer. Verse number six then, look at the counsel that he gives us here. He says, but thou, when thou prayest, Enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Jesus doesn't just warn us against and caution us against performance prayer. Jesus, afterwards, he gives us counsel for proper prayer. What is it about prayer that we need to understand in order to to be able to, to pray correctly? Well, Jesus points out a couple of different things here. Number one, he points out the importance. You look at this passage over and over and over. Verse number five, it says, and uh, put that verse up there, David. Verse number five, it says, and what's that next word, church? And, and, and. Verse number six, it says, but thou, when thou prayest. Even verse number seven, but yeah, you can take a guess. Yeah, absolutely. Verse number seven, but. When we pray, hey, do do you see the running theme? Prayer is important. Three times in this passage, Jesus says, when you pray, not if you pray. When you pray. Let me ask you, 
what was your prayer life this week? Especially as we'll get into outside of those prayers that you had with others, outside of the Wednesday nights and outside of the Sundays and, and outside of the family devotion circle, outside of all of that, what was your prayer life this week? You see, proper prayer, it's important. It's a when, not an if. How important is prayer? When do you pray? Why do you pray? I think a lot of times that, that we as Christians just kind of accept the fact that yes, prayer is available, and yes, prayer is wonderful, and yes, I know I should probably pray more. And we just kind of make statements like that and move right on with our life. And it doesn't affect us one bit. It's important, church. Prayer is important. It matters. It is one of our greatest privileges as a Christian to be able to go before the throne of our heavenly Father, to be able to walk right up to His throne, to find mercy and grace to help in time of need, to go as His child into His presence. It matters, church. It matters, it matters, it matters when we pray. I'm going to tell you, that convicts me. How many of us would characterize our lives by busy? Show, show of hands tonight. How many would say we're busy? Even in a time of pandemic where everything's shut down, right? We're busy. Why? Because busy is a word that just characterizes our society now. How many of us would say on a regular basis we're tired? Right, because again, tired is just one of those words that characterizes our society right now. Do you know what some of the greatest enemies of prayer are? Is busy and tired. Because when you pray, what in essence are you doing? You are quieting your heart. Focusing your heart to go to your heavenly Father. I'm going to tell you, the devil may be defeated, but he's no dummy. And the devil knows exactly what he needs to do to try to undermine the church from praying. The counsel for proper prayer, Jesus points out it is important. He also points out it's individual. In other words, it's private. He says, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee open. It's individual. In other words, it's private. It's between you and God in secret. You and God in secret. It's personal. It's between you and God alone. Guess what? You don't need a priest to pray for you. You can go before the throne of God. Hey, breaking news. You have the exact same access to God as me. As Pastor Lewis. You have the exact same access to God as, as every other born-again believer. Hey, boys and girls, can I let you in on a little secret? You know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior. You have the exact same access to God that your mom and dad do. You do. And the Bible here points out that not only is it important, it is deeply individual. The, the, the admonition for us to go into our closet in secret, just me, just God, and to be able to pour myself before him in prayer, it is private, it is personal, it is impactful. Jesus said, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. It is impactful. You know what happens when we pray sometimes? Sometimes, now here Jesus specifically says in verse number six that God responds to our prayers. Did you pick up on that? Come on church, preach with me a little bit tonight. Did you pick up on that? David, put that back on the screen, verse number six. That uh, the Father which sees in secret shall reward thee openly. In other words, what's it teaching? It's teaching that God responds to my prayer. God responds to my prayer. And so prayer is impactful. Do you know what I cannot do? I cannot do anything that would probably move our president to action. 
I can't personally do anything that would probably motivate the governments of the world to action. The Queen of England or Parliament or Vladimir Putin or China or any other country for that matter. Chances are I probably couldn't even get city council here in Clyde to do something. But to think that when I shut my door and I pray to my father in secret, I may not be able to get city council here in Clyde to move, but I can get the almighty, eternal king, the sovereign God, the creator of heaven and earth, I can get him to move on my behalf. It is impactful. You know what happens when we pray? Sometimes, sometimes, and, and I'll say this and let me explain, sometimes God may change his plans. I want you to notice here, look at James chapter 5 with me. Beginning in verse number 16, it says, Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. We're going to pause here on verse 16 before, go, we go, before we go forward. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And so the teaching here is that right prayer, proper prayer, accomplishes much work. In other words, it changes things. Amen. It changes things. And then it gives an example. Verse number 17, it says this. It says, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we. In other words, Elijah was just like me or you. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. So get it from the context. Does he have any instruction from God to pray this way? Do we see that biblically? No. D does he have any promise from God to pray this way? I don't see that biblically either. But the Bible says he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Verse number 18. The Bible says this. And he prayed again and the heaven gave forth rain and the earth brought forth her fruit. In other words, right prayer accomplishes much work. Prayer changes things. And the illustration given was Elijah praying that it might not rain rain. We don't necessarily explicitly see that delineated out as God's express plan, but the Bible says that God responded to Elijah's plan, to Elijah's prayer, sorry, and it rained not. Now, how does that fit in with what we talked about this morning, that God and his sovereign government, that God is going to accomplish his will? Let me give you an illustration. In other words, say with me uh, that one of my kids wanted to ask me to play. Maybe we were going to go shoot hoops, or maybe we were going to go play in the backyard, or maybe we were going to go for a walk, or rollerblade, or bike, or something like that. But I had it in my heart that I was going to mow the lawn. That was my plan as sovereign ruler of the household. I'm going to mow my lawn. Now, if one of my children came and said, Daddy, Daddy, I love you so much. Daddy, you're the best daddy. Daddy, can we such and such? You know, chances are I may rearrange my plans to accommodate the heart and desire of my child. Now, is the lawn still going to get mowed? If you know me, if I'm out there after dark rigging a headlight on that lawn mower, is that lawn going to get mowed? You better believe it. And so my plan will still get fulfilled, but you know what? One of my children asks, I, I just may respond to their request. And from an earthly viewpoint, rearrange my plans a little bit. Let me give you an example from the Bible, Hezekiah. You'll remember that the Lord had sent the prophet to tell Hezekiah, you go die. I mean, basically, that was the me message. Get your house in order. You go die. And those of you who know the biblical account, you'll know that Hezekiah didn't like that message, that Hezekiah didn't really accept that message, that Hezekiah, the Bible says, turned his face to the wall, and he began to pray. He began to pray that God might heal him, that God might prolong his life. And what happened? Before the prophet even left the building, God said, turn around. i got to change in message. And the Lord extended Hezekiah's life. Now, did Hezekiah ultimately die? Yeah, he did. 
But God responded to the prayer of Hezekiah. Understand how impactful prayer is. That the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That right prayer does much work. Prayer changes things. And sometimes, from that earthly perspective, God just might change his plans. But you know, the other thing that can happen is God just might change our hearts. I think of the Apostle Paul, and those of you who, who know the Apostle Paul in his life know that he suffered from a terrible affliction. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, he begins to talk about how thrice he prayed God that this thorn in the flesh, that this affliction that he had might depart from him. That three times he begged of God that God might take it away. Verse number 9, the Bible says this. He says, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Hold on, notice the change of heart. Read it with me. He said, most gladly therefore I will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. What happened? Did God change Paul's situation? No. But God changed Paul's heart. You see, proper prayer is impactful. Prayer changes things. Prayer changes things. Why do you think the devil doesn't want us to pray? Because prayer changes things. Why do you think the devil wants us to toil away at work and just work, 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 work? Because he knows that prayer changes things. Why do you think the devil would rather have us worry and just sit around and worry and worry and worry and worry? Because he can keep us working and if he can keep us worrying and if he can keep us doing everything but praying because he knows prayer changes things. Prayer changes things. And so Jesus here gives counsel for proper prayer, for us to recognize its importance, that it's individual, and that it is impactful. Jesus ends this instruction by giving us some conditions for powerful prayer. Verses 7 and 8 read like this. It says, but when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them. Don't do that. For your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. And so Jesus here gives us some final instructions. We can call them conditions for powerful prayer. He says here first that we need to refrain, refrain from vain Repetition, that's a mouthful. Refrain from vain repetition. This is heathen. This is just babbling, mindless words. This is saying the same thing over and over and over where it becomes habit, where it becomes rote, where it becomes just mindless babbling. That is heathen. You know, you see it around the world even today. You see it in, in, in the Buddhist religion, in the Buddhist culture with their wheel. And they'll just walk and talk and walk and talk and just mutter and mumble and mutter and mumble. And they'll say the same things over and over and over again. You see it in religions like Islam where as they pray, they pray these same prayers over and over and over again. They become mindless. They become ritualistic. It's just what they do at given times of the day. You see it also in, in some religions like Catholicism with the rosary it's the same things over and over and over and over and over again and before we're so quick to get on our high horse you do it at mealtime and bedtime too and so do I you know thank you Jesus for this day thank you for our food Bless to our body. I mean, we all have, we all have those little niches those, those, those little go-to sayings don't we for those go-to times when it becomes mindless, when it becomes rote, when it becomes just a matter of the babble instead of a matter of deep meaning, it has become vain repetition and it has become heathen before God. In other words, when we pray, what the Lord is after is meaning 
not mindlessness. What the Lord is after when we pray is conversation, not chance. It is casting our cares on Him because He cares for us. That's what God is after. And the reality is, church, we can go to Him and pray for anything. And, and, and the, Jesus is very clear. We don't get extra points in heaven because we repeat the same thing 37 times. We don't. I had a young man today. Young man today before church, he pulled me aside and said, Pastor, will you, will you pray for our family? One of our pets is very, very sick, and we're going to have to put him down, and, and we're just so sad about it. And the young man was genuinely broken. And I said, you know what, buddy? We, we sat down right in that pew right there that's roped off. We broke the rules, sat in the pew, and we prayed together before church this morning. Why? Because we can pray about anything. Yesterday at lunch, or the other day at lunch, I prayed, I prayed for my mealtime prayer that my grass would grow. Because I really want grass to grow, and I need the Lord to accomplish that. How many of us know that when it's genuine from the heart, that we can pray about anything, anywhere? It's not a chant. And church, we have got to be so careful that we don't turn times of prayer into our own versions of vain repetition and just say the same thing every time. Meaning, not mindlessness. And so Jesus admonishes us to refrain from vain, empty repetition. He also admonishes us to rest in relationship. He says in verse number 8, be not ye therefore like unto them for your, what's the word church? Father. In other words, hey, you understand when we pray that we pray to a loving Father, not a detached deity. We're not praying to an idol. We're not praying to stone. We're not praying to nature. We're not praying to some invisible force. We're not praying to some, some detached deity that has no interaction with what's going on. No, we are praying to our loving, heavenly Father. And I'm going to tell you, when God calls himself our Father, it speaks to both the relationship that he has with us and the responsibility he has to us. I'm going to tell you this, we don't take the needs of our kids lightly. We don't, as human earthly people. How many look on the needs of our kids or on the needs of our grandkids and we think, eh, you know, I know they haven't eaten in three weeks, but... They'll get over it. Oh, I know their heart is broken over this thing that's happened, but eh, got to be tougher. Oh, I know, I know that, no, we as parents, and we are very much in tune with the needs of our kids. You know, the application Jesus makes towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, verse 11, is this. If we being evil, we being fallen, we being sinful people know how to give good gifts unto our children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give good things to them that ask Him? You know what? Not only do we refrain from vain repetitions, but we also rest in relationship. When you ask your father, you understand that your father has taken your request seriously. Prayer, prayer is an ongoing conversation. You know, you might even say this. It's not necessarily the length of the prayer that matters in a life. It's probably more important the length you go between prayers. You think of it from a human standpoint, that conversation. If I talk to my kid for 30 minutes once a week, I'm going to know him a whole lot less than if I had talked to him for five minutes every day. Or I had talked to him for five minutes three times a day. It's not so much the length of the prayers. So sometimes we get, you know, sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer. Sometimes we feel so guilty because some of us have never spent an entire hour in prayer. 
It's not so much the length of the prayer, it's perhaps the length between the prayer that matters more. That's what the Apostle Paul meant when he told us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 to pray without ceasing. It wasn't that, that that we need to have a never-ending, ongoing, conscious conversation with God. I mean, I sleep a good six, eight hours a night, so I mean, I kind of lose a third of my day right there. Paul's saying it not, doesn't, it's not that it's a never-ending kind of matter. No, but it's a constant, ongoing, moment by moment. It's not the length of, but the length between that really matters. And so Jesus admonishes us to refrain from vain repetition. He admonishes us to rest in relationship. And he admonishes us to rely on his resources. Because our Father knows what things we have need of before we ask Him. You know, prayer is just as big as God is, and God can do anything. Amen? One of the verses we love to quote, Ephesians 3 and verse number 20, where it talks about a God who is able to do exceeding, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Hey, we love to talk about a God who, who is exceeding and abundant above all that we could ask or think. Well, hey, if that's the God we know and love, little advice, don't get too disappointed if he doesn't do exactly what you want him to do. It just might mean that he desires to do exceeding above all that you could even ask or think him to do. Now let's be honest, most of us would be fine if God would just do what we say. I mean, right? What we say when we say it, I mean, everything would be okay. But no, that's not it. It's we rely on his resources. It's the reality that he is God and we are not. It is the reality that he is the one who is exceeding, abundant, above all that we could ask or think. And so when God doesn't do exactly what we want, hey, just let him be God and do what God does. With his resources, I promise you won't be disappointed. You know, church, I don't want to be personally, and I don't want to be professionally, and I don't want to be corporately hypocritical or heathen in my prayers. I want my prayers to impact heaven so in turn God will impact earth. But I'm going to tell you, we must be focused on our private prayer life with me and God with you and God. Concerned with the heart of our prayers more than the public hearing of our prayers. Church, Christian, how's your prayer life? How's your prayer life? I mean, Jesus here gives very clear instructions. And hey, we're going we're gonna to be in this. He's going to go right into what we call the Lord's Prayer. So really, for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be right in here as Jesus teaches us to pray. But church, how's your prayer life? Here at the outset of this, let's really take stock. I mean, one of the questions that I always ask, it's always super convicting to me, is if every Christian prayed as much as you did this week, how busy would God have been? If every Christian had prayed like you did this week, would there have been moments or even vast swaths of time where there was no one praying? Church, I go right back to the counsel for proper prayer. Prayer is important. Prayer is impactful. Let's be a church that strives to have prayers that impact heaven so that God will in turn impact earth.